Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the IDRS virtual symposium. I want to thank you all for, for coming and coming for, to this, uh, this particular session uh, where we are really talking about uh, you know, Black artistry as it relates to double read playing. Uh, and you have some of the, really some of the world's great musicians here uh, on, this, on this panel. So I'm, I'm really excited to have a chance to, to speak with them. And um, I'm really excited also for the rest of you to, uh, to have a chance to engage with the, the panelists as well. Uh, so I'm really gonna jump right in. I'll start with my own self, uh, Lacoleen Washington, uh, bassoonist. I'm the executive director of the Community Music Center of Boston. Uh, prior to my time in administration, I was the uh, assistant professor of bassoon at the University of Missouri and the associate professor of bassoon at the University of Memphis. Uh, I was in uh, academia for about 15 years uh, before I started moving out into doing more uh, community-based work, uh, doing more, you know, more work as it related to social justice and, uh, and community engagement, which really led me to the position I am right now, uh, which is leading one of the largest community music schools in the country. Uh, and here in Boston, we have uh, just super dope work. And it was really important for me as I moved and transitioned out of a, <clears throat> out of a classical music career, uh, to try to really refine myself because while I was within classical music, I felt that I had committed cultural suicide. Uh, and it took me really kind of unplugging from classical music uh, to actually find the person that, uh, that I'd always been inside, but had never been able to be professionally. Uh, and so I've at this point promised, you know, for the rest of my, I got, you know, the the assimilated side of me got about 25 years of my life. And so I'm giving the rest of my life to the part of me that's not assimilated. Uh, and so uh, I'm basically I'm free now. Uh, and so um, I would like to give the other artists an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, why don't in my screen, I've actually got Garrett, uh, Garrett McQueen. Uh, so can, you mind if we start with you? Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me. My name is Garrett McQueen. Uh, most folks know me these days as a media personality. I'm the executive uh, producer and co-host of the Triloquy podcast. It's a show that uh, really focuses on challenging all of the status quos within classical music, even that phrase classical music. I tend to use the phrase so-called classical music. Um, I started uh, that show um, in conjunction with American Public Media uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, about six months ago, um, my co-host and I um, purchased uh, the intellectual property and all the rights. So it's now um, an independently um, run show that I'm very happy about. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I am uh, one of two uh, national hosts for um, a show called Music Through the Night uh, based here in St. Paul, um, Minnesota. Um, I'm on the air Wednesday through Saturday, um, midnight uh, to 6 a.m. Central Time. Um, I'm, I'm, I simulcast on about 300 public radio stations um, and, and stream online, but I did uh, begin my career um, as a bassoonist. I actually um, took my very first bassoon lesson um, in my life as an undergrad uh, with Lacolian at the University of Memphis, uh, went on to earn a master's um, in bassoon uh, with Judy Farmer from the University of Southern California. Uh, went on um, to uh, play with the Detroit Symphony in their fellowship program for a couple years. Um, following that, I won a job um, with the Knoxville Symphony Orchestra. And, um, you know, very similar to what Lacolian was saying along the lines, I, I just kind of felt and realized the assimilation that, um, that I was a, a part of. So when an opportunity came for me to have an even bigger platform um, than, than playing bassoon uh, with the Knoxville Symphony, I took it. So I, I took a job with, um, uh, with WUOT-FM, the local radio station, public radio station in Knoxville. Um, my work um, at the intersection of race and classical music um, began to get a bit of national attention and uh, on a trip uh, subbing with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, folks at American Public Media reached out to me. Um, three, that was in December of 2017, uh, three months after that. I was invited to apply for a position, and um, three months after that, I uh, packed a U-Haul. So, um, you know, uh, I do still play bassoon, but uh, because of the status quo of classical music and the world, you know, I felt that it was my responsibility to leave the stage in an official capacity and really dedicate myself to um, liberating minds and, and having conversations uh, that might inspire real actual change in the field. So uh, once again, uh, thanks for having me and it's really great to be here. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, now next is Atoyan. Hi everyone. 
I'm starting the oboe side of this conversation. Um, I have been lucky enough to play in a wonderful ensemble called Imani Wins for 23 years now. And uh, it's been, I think my career has had fits and starts along the way. Um, when I got out of school from Oberlin and Manhattan School, I was a gung-ho orchestral player. And I was taking auditions, and at one of those auditions, I realized I didn't want to be an uh, orchestral oboist. And then I said to myself, um, mainly because, by the way, I knew I would be one of the only, or not, well, it was part of it, but I realized I'd be one of the only people of color in the orchestra that I would get into. And I would have no control over what I was playing, and, or very little. Or, and I would just have no control over the business of what I was doing. So that kind of moment of clarity or uncertainty maybe uh, led me to dedicate myself to Imani Wins, a wind quintet that at the time in my 98 or 99 or, go, or so uh, wasn't doing much, but being in charge of my life was more important to me than making money or even getting to play Beethoven as much as I love to do that. So um, went on and you know, I've, you know, I've been in the group for a long time and I feel like even though I've had the same job, I'm just getting my traction on now. Like I feel like I'm picking up steam and moving ahead. Um, we just started a foundation a couple of years ago and which is, and I'm the main uh, fundraiser for that. And I'm feeling like I'm getting <clears throat> more of my voice, um, oboe-wise too. Actually, this uh, the, uh, during this whole pandemic, we'll talk about this more. But uh, thanks to Catherine Needleman and other people who've done great research, um, I'm playing a lot of music by people of color now and by women composers, and I'm feeling super excited about that. So um, the full steam ahead, 2020, it, it is both a blessing and a curse for me but I'm happy to hear, be here and listen to everybody talk and um, talk a little bit and show, share my perspective. Thank you for that, Toyin. Uh, Monica? You're up next, sorry. <laughs> hello, hello, everybody. You, you put the two uh, Imaniites right back to back, which is, which is totally fine. <laughs> uh, Good evening, everyone. My name is Monica Ellis. I am the administrative director and one of the founding members of Imani Wins with uh, my dear, dear friend and amazing colleague, Toyin Spelman Diaz. Uh, we kind of hold down the fort for sure with, uh, with the group these days and for many years have done that. Um, and it's really been an honor to, to for, as Toyin said, 23 next season, this coming season will be our 24th year um, we've, we've really, uh, I'm proud to say we've boldly brought this intentionally black ensemble to hot, to inclusive audiences though, to audiences of, of all ages and backgrounds and, and, uh, places of knowledge of, of, of classical and non-classical music. And so to, to bring that experience to our audiences has really been a pleasure for us. It's been something that I think, um, all of us take a lot of pride in and, and uh, a lot of humility as well. Um, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, had an incredible teaching process and uh, experience with, with some really powerful people that just um, led me to, to where I am today, my family, my teachers. Toyin and I actually met at Oberlin where I did my undergrad and then I did my grad at uh, Juilliard with Frank Morelli, um, did a post-grad thing at Manhattan School of Music, and shortly after that in 97, um, Imani Wynn started. And as she said, there was certainly no, no big time incomes coming in at, at the beginning in no <laughs> way, shape or form, but um, we did pretty early on uh, have a sense and an awareness that we were doing something special and something um, important to have a primarily black and um, uh, brown group that not primarily completely that um, had not been done before. And we didn't even realize that we didn't really think about it as something new per se. Um, it, from my perspective, at least, it took some years for us, for me to really, really realize the um, 
the importance of that platform that we would eventually, you know, have. But um, what we did realize is that the camaraderie between us was lightning in a bottle and, and we captured it and um, took it on the road, put it in a minivan, you know, let it loose, brought it back in. And um, I think that soulfulness and that familiar um, feeling that we have had and continue to have is what people were um, touched by over over the years. Um, so yeah, great to be here. Great to see new and old friends. Uh, so thank you for having me. Thank you, Monica and Esther. Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Esther Williams. I am an oboist based in London, as you can probably tell from the accent. Uh, I won't give a long introduction. So I'm a member of Chineke Orchestra there. I am a freelance oboist. I don't specify to anything. I will play solo works, chamber works, uh, orchestral, operas, musicals, anything that requires an oboe, I will play or happily play it for you. Uh, teaching wise, I'm teach um, in a few institutions in London. I also work in the Royal Academy of Music and I'm really passionate just about making the oboe just more accessible to everybody, whether that's old, young, whether you've never tried the oboe before or whether you are coming back to the oboe, anybody. All right, thank you. So thank you, thank you to everybody. And thank you for sharing little pieces of your stories. And I would love to first go back to um, some of the things that you mentioned just in your story, some things I'm just really curious about, because to be honest, I feel like I'm a kid in the candy store being able to talk to the four of you. Um, because some of the things that we've talked about, because um, I've known many of you for, uh, for a while, um, but um, I was in grad school at the same time. Uh, with Toyin and Monica. Um, uh, but I guess my first question, Toyin, is for you. Um, and you talked about how the work that you're doing right now artistically, playing more women, playing more work by women and by people of color. And you talk, and, and what, what I'm hearing in that is this, this relevance of your identity, uh, of connecting your art to your identity. Can you just tell me a little bit more about like why that is so meaningful to you uh, and how it might be different than what your experiences might have been before you were really committing to playing works by women and by people of color? Well, I mean, being in Imani Wins, we've dedicated ourselves to playing music by composers of color forever. And we've had a in the last five or so years a dedication to women composers. So that wasn't new, but because we're in this time of the pandemic, um, we aren't able to play together anymore. And so I'm stuck with the dilemma of having to practice only for myself. And that can be, I'm, I'm not making that many reads, by the way, I gotta admit. Anybody else, you know, show of hands, you read making going down. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. So I'm spending time just uh, playing for myself. And so it's really interesting to have everything after your long tones more and your scales and etudes be about yourself. That's an amazing moment. And it's got me more motivated to practice than I've been in a long time. Now, if I could just skip my afternoon nap, I would get a little extra time in but it's it's just been incredible i'm i'm feeling really excited and um also being in this time of um violence against black people i have um had the opportunity to talk to more and more people about the experience of being an african-american woman oboist and so that has been a tremendous opportunity that has come to me that is beyond being just a player and I mean, like I said, Imani wins. We, we talk to people all the time and it's just nice to have a moment to just do it on my own for a second. Um, I, I love the support that I've had through my amazing colleagues like Monica and the rest of the ensemble. But um, there's just a level of fear that I always have of being by myself. Um, and I'm just getting over that more and more here, even though I'm more isolated than ever. <laughs> but it's been it's been pretty cool. It's been pretty cool, I gotta say. Thank you. Garrett, my next question is for you. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned in your introduction was about 
the idea of liberating minds. Uh, that was something that that landed uh, that landed on me um, when you said it. And you mind just maybe unpacking that? What, what do you mean when you say you know that's your new thing is thinking about ways to uh, ways of liberating minds? Yeah, well, you know, Lacoline, of course, this is a conversation we've had several times. But you know, when I when I mean that, what I mean by that is understanding the systems under which we were taught to play our instruments. So think about the first time you you opened up that case, where some of the first little ditties you learned, songs you knew, songs that spoke to um, folks who look like me, or was it um, Mary Had a Little Lamb, or, or, or Go Tell Aunt Rhody? You know, let's go up into, um, into the college years when we begin to talk about um, music theory and all that sort of thing. You know, what were the pieces of music used to train us? Uh, by what ruler did we learn how to play in tune, how, how to phrase? All of this came from a Western European structure, uh, a structure that never was really built with folks um, like me in mind. So, you know, again, uh, after I won my job with the Knoxville Symphony um, and would look out into that crowd of only white faces over and over and over again, you know, I began to question, well, what what am I doing? Who who am I speaking to? So, you know, my, my sort of awakening um, in that moment, again, is, is what led to to, um, to to my career shift and um, and I've and and again as I've said before I've really just dedicated myself to trying to get other people to to think about those simple concepts and how they have you know played such a big role in the way we think about music the way we think about good music great music the way we think about our teachers you know I'll I'll, I'll say completely candidly that um, Lacolian and I definitely had a had a couple um, skirmishes while I was uh, his teacher. But, you know, in, in retrospect, what I see in that was that Lacolian was in that moment acting as my oppressor in a way. After his awakening, you know, that, that fueled my awakening and that helped me really understand everything that was happening and how we can really make this a, a more equitable world for all of us. We have to ask ourselves questions that um, no one has asked before, including, you know, from the very beginning, what is the music we have learned? By what means did we learn to play our instruments? And how does that impact our, our complete uh, view and perspective on this thing that we call classical music? And if I, and, I was, and Garrett, I, I agree with every word that Garrett just said. Um, you know, he did, he, there's, there's no word that he uttered that was untrue. Uh, those, those, every word that he uttered was absolutely true. Um, because as I said, I was fully assimilated. So I was just teaching what I had been taught, which is what we all do. We teach what we were taught without a thought to uh, its impact on the people that we're teaching. Um, and it wasn't until I think sometime later, actually we had a conversation soon after he left and he told me, I told him, I was like, I'm now hearing everything you were saying to me as an undergraduate student. And Garrett said to me, well, everyone evolves in their own time. Uh, <laughs> and I always remembered that uh, because there was so much compassion in that, uh, that, 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 I, that, I, that I genuinely, I genuinely heard. Um, but I think, I think Garrett used some really important language, which was that that system was his oppressor. Um, because I think it's important to name the things, um, not to say that it was uncomfortable to him, uh, because that centers Garrett, but the system was the oppressor, <laughs> right? We're not so, we get, so where I was in many ways, and I think we as teachers believe that we're solving for our students. Uh, in addition to solving for our students, we're also solving for the system that they exist in. Uh, and we can't just pick the one. Uh, and so I think that, you know, to Garrett's point, and, I'm, and thank you for saying that, uh, because you're absolutely right. And I'm, I imagine that there are college professors out there that are thinking about the things that the, the supports that they have given to their young people and probably realizing that they may think that who they are doesn't matter. All that matters is what comes out of the end of their bell. And when you think that way, you are the oppressor. That is what the oppressor says. And that is how the oppressor thinks. Uh, so thank you, Garrett, for, um, uh, for, for sharing that and sharing that perspective. Um, I'm gonna go over to uh, Monica. Uh, before I open up to some more general questions, I wanna go over to Monica. 
Uh, Monica, you mentioned something about the Imani wins, and it wasn't until you were in it for a minute that you were like, oh, wow, this is something new, right? <laughs> um, can you just describe a little bit about what that experience, what it was like to be like, oh, people think that this is new, but in the early days, you were also playing standard rep, um, right? right and so when you thought about that, like what was it, when you went on the journey of like trying to define what it was, uh, excuse me, standard Western European repertoire, um, you know, like when you, when you thought about that, um, what was that awakening like for you to be like, oh, black people playing Hindemith, I guess is new. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so do you mind sharing that, sharing that thing, that, you know, how, what that journey was like for you? Sure, sure, I'll try for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, and I think be, I grew up in such, um, I guess, an assimilated fashion. I, um, I certainly know my, my heritage and there was no doubt that I'm a black woman and I'm, I was a black girl growing up playing this instrument, but it was never something that was particularly emphasized in, in my, in my growing up period in my household. It, it was, it, um, i you know, I consider myself really fortunate that I didn't have any overt, um, racist acts held against me. Um, so, you know, there was not this sense that I, that I was kind of coming to a group like Imani wins or, or really create a group like Imani wins and try to have that platform of being, of being an all African American and Latino group be um, its main thing. I think we were, we were so, and continue to be so um, emphasized on playing the Hindemith, the best, as an example, the best that we could so that there would be no doubt in the oppressor's minds, in the, in the, uh, in the status quo minds that we couldn't do it. You know, I think we wanted to show um, that by any means necessary, we can get the job done just like a white group can. So that awareness was there, but but it was fueled by just being excellent. It was fueled by by the pursuit of excellence. Um, and then along the way, we found ourselves playing music by, of course, Valerie Coleman. We can never speak about Imani Wins without having her name in the mix as the um, as the originator of the group, we're Tori and I are founding members, but it was her initial idea. Um, and her music, her music came from an absolute black experience grow, growing up in Louisville, Kentucky. No way around it. And then Jeff Scott, he, he eventually brought music to the group. He, his came from an absolute black experience growing up in Far Rockaway, Queens, you know, North and South too. That was an interesting dichotomy with their, with their music. So we were bringing that, you know, that experience to, to our audiences. Um, but yes, at the same time, I think we definitely wanted to prove something you know, wanted to show wanted to show that the the so called standard repertoire was very very um, um, within our um, within our grasp. Um, so so right, the, I guess the awakening, the word that you use, that awakening um, did take some time because we were so in the trenches, um, and even to this day. Uh, and I think anybody of any any race can relate to that, that we spend a lot of time in a small little box, right? Going like this, <laughs> we had double readers out there just scraping at reads and, and buzzing and scraping at reads. You know, we spend a lot of time by ourselves and uh, not kind of recognizing the greater culture that we're a part of. Um, and Imani Wins really, although we did that, the five of us spent a lot of time in a small little box, just getting the intonation down, getting our sound down, getting all of these things uh, 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 in our, you know, at our disposal. But then there, there, there had to be a, that awakening, uh, you know, pretty soon in that, listen, we're doing something special here. We're, we have to recognize that. We have to even pay homage to that um, and not only be the most excellent that we can be, but show the diversity in the repertoire. You know, if, if, if literally five black and brown people was up there playing uh, the instruments that we play and all we had was a program of white men, it would be absurd. <laughs> it really would, I think. So, um, you know, the awakening came because we just said, okay, let's step outside this small box we're in just trying to be excellent and look at the bigger picture but the awareness i think was always there if that makes any sense 
<laughs> no, it totally does. It totally does. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. And just a couple of a couple of things that have come across. Um, we're going to come back to, and we're going to talk a little bit. Um, uh, our next segment um, after we hear from Esther uh, will be around this necessity for white validation. Um, That's a big and, one. And the and the impact of that on someone who's not white. Uh, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, and we, so we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that for sure. Uh, but Esther, uh, you play with Chinake, which is, you know, maybe you can share a little bit for those who don't know what the orchestra is. Maybe you can share a little bit about it. But can you share with me, um, you know, from your perspective, being, uh, being in Europe right now, how do some of these things play themselves out to you and with you as someone, um, as someone who's, you know, for many of us here across the pond? Uh, well, Chinake is the first black and ethnic minority orchestra of Europe, and it's formed in 2015. And there's a senior orchestra, for which I've played in a few times, and then there's the junior orchestra, which I also mentor, to help them advance them to become professional players. And um, nothing is really different in the US to the UK. We are all going through the exact same problems of racism. We are all feeling the same... Um, feelings of feeling isolated, feeling alone, feeling pushed down. I've had lots of horrible racist treatment in my career. I've been in concert venues where I've been in between rehearsals, somebody has broken my reeds. Before auditions, somebody has broken my reeds. Um, I remember walking into concert venues and security would stop me and say, um, where are you going? And I'd say, I'm going to play in the orchestra and then he said um can I see your instrument so like I had to prove that I wasn't lying and then they had someone to escort me to go back to the dressing room I've had another case where security have said to me uh excuse me catering is that way and I'm like uh I'm not part of the catering crew I'm part of the orchestra and then again I've had to show um prove that um there's lots of things like one thing I we all briefly discussed before this one hundred was hair, and I've been told a few times before concerts, can you just learn how to tame it, just so it so you could be more appealing, and so from that just to fit in to be able to play so that my position isn't jeopardized i would then straighten my hair for every rehearsal when those comments about me going to a concert venue was made i always thought it was my fault i thought okay i'm being i'm being accused of being part of the catering company because i'm wearing a black top and black trousers so then since that day i would then wear long black dresses um yeah that's just a little summary <laughs> No, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you for thank you for your vulnerability and sharing those very personal stories. So, I want to you know definitely thank you for that. Um, the next the next part I'd like for us to talk a little bit about um, because that's where many of the but even before you get to the content of the pedagogy and the learning and the performances themselves, uh, you have to talk about the frame in which they exist. Um, and they exist inside this frame of the necessity for white validation. Uh, and I will share a personal story, one that I've wanted to share for a long time. Um, when I went up for tenure, uh, I was tenured in, you know, 2008, something like seven, 2007, 2008, something like that. And when I went up for tenure, my tenure project was a, a CD of music for bassoon by black composers. Um, and one of my external reviewers uh, got my CD and her comment was, it's impossible for me to tell whether or not this person can play with quality because they're not playing standard repertoire. Um, so because I was, because I decided in my career to champion the music of people from my cultural heritage, there were some inside the community, a community of which I was a part of, who said, there's no place for that here until we validate you through our lenses. Uh, I never forgot that. And that was actually on some level, the beginning of my exit from that field um, was some of the some of the language and that was in my tenure file, uh, which was my career at that point, <laughs> right? Anyone who's gone up for tenure, that's your career in that binder and in that in that box. 
Um, and, and so there, and there were parts of my, the parts of my career in which I focused on my heritage were not valid uh, in that space. And the reason, I, the reason I share that is because um, each one of us has talked a little bit about this necessity for, uh, for this, this white validation. And some of us have, we've been assimilated and so we've accepted it. And some of us have had to take it off and say that I'm not, I'm not gonna be part of that. And some of us had to find this balance uh, you know, this balance between that. Uh, so I'll leave this one more to the room rather than asking an individual. As you think about this idea of, um, of white validation, maybe we can, you can share a little bit of your thoughts on that, either the impacts that it has had on you individually or, you know, the problems and challenges with that. Um, you know, the, what are the parts of the system that have led to that? I'd love to just hear from, from any of you um, what your thoughts are on this, this necessity inside the field for white validation as step one. I'll, I'll kick it off. So, you know, I, I think that that need for white validation again come from, comes from the system um, by which we were bred as musicians. I mean, think about the composers that we were taught. Think, thinking about, think about the music, you know, with a few exceptions, think about who taught us to play these instruments. So it was only whiteness that was put before us when it came time for, you know, our, our skills, our so-called excellence to be measured. And I want to go back quickly, you know, to that word excellence. Think about, again, how has that been defined by us and by what means was um, excellence uh, sort of exposed to us? Was it listening to a perfectly crafted um, studio CD? Was it uh, by listening to uh, bassoonists and oboists who had every opportunity, went to X, Y, and Z school, play with the Cleveland Orchestra or whatever, you know? So when, when we think about excellence, when, when we think about validation, it's important to recognize that, you know, for, for so long, we have only had that to, to measure ourselves by. I mean, let's all face it, we all know the names Florence Price and William Grant still now, but how many of us knew those names 10, 15, 20 years ago? You know, I'm 33 years old and those names didn't even come through my education until uh, LaColeen recorded that CD that um, I was talking about. I, I aired a track from it uh, on my show last night, actually. Uh, so. So uh, there you go. Um, but but yeah, so when we when we talk about um, that white validation, again, I, I think it's very important to um, just sort of accept the fact that every ruler that we've had to measure ourselves by has been that. So it's, it's hard for us to um, escape until we decide, you know, as, as it's uh, been laid out here to to set that to the uh, set that to the side and focus on our music. Um, our communities and how we can empower, you know, ourselves as a community within this world of music. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, Monica? Yeah, I, I think the end of what Garrett, you, you just said, we have to decide. Everybody makes and has to make conscious decisions to change this trajectory. And um, the interview that I did that, that came with the New York, came, you know, was a part of the New York Times piece that that recently happened was this rather extensive interview. And I was hoping that the hundred words they would pick would be something, something that I said that made some daggone sense. And so I'm glad it was. Um, but uh, it, but what, what I said is that this, and it's applicable to, to this conversation right now, is that um, we are in a, a white institution built by predominantly white men, white but predominantly men that have served white communities and uh, until there is a, a market shift in the desire to serve non-white communities, there won't really be a, cha a change. I mean, that's just what it is. That, that article was basically like, why aren't there more black people in orchestras? Well, an orchestra <laughs> is a European institution, period, that was imported here. So, you know, we can add um, uh, touches of American of black American and brown American qualities can be added to it, but is it going to actually serve those communities um, or will it serve those communities with the repertoire that that is primarily what it's about? No, I don't think so. It has to be, there has to be this concerted effort, this distinct decision to, to serve those communities and then the, like I said in the article, the byproduct is the diversity of it. The byproduct is more people of color in these in, in these very white institutions. Look, we, you know, Toyin said it. 
we love Beethoven. I don't love, I don't, I don't, I love Beethoven. I want to play Brahms. Like, so this is not about wanting to not do what is the standard and not do what is the, and then standard, we got to get rid of that word, right? But for the sake of the conversation, we'll continue. Um, it's, it's, yeah, this is not about not wanting to do those things, but it's about the inclusion of others. Um, so, right. And just to really quickly to touch on the Imani Wins um, experience with with pieces that are, again, in the standard wind quintet repertoire. Like I said, we did have that impetus to play those pieces to, to, a, to an extent to show that we could. Um, we happen to really like Nielsen and Hindemith, and we happen to really like the Rite of Spring arrangement that we had done in Scheherazade. So, you know, at the end of the day, we were still playing music that spoke to us. I'm not really trying to play Rika and Donzi, just for the record, but <laughs> so, I, so I do draw a line. Um, so, so there. Uh, so we did play pieces that come from the white experience, um, but that still were important to us. And I think that's important to state. I guess that's what I'm wanted, what I'm trying to say. That um, simply because it doesn't come from our experience, we can still bring it to our table and play it and play the hell out of it and make it a part of our experience. You know. Um, so it's it's a it's a it's a very wide wide conversation no thank you for that monica i was you know while while you and garrett were, were sharing your perspective i was really thinking about this um uh, george lewis is a black composer um and um he was the he was an award winner i'm on the board of chamber music america and he won one of the awards this year and one of the things in his in his speech uh, he was a keynote he was a keynote speaker excuse me but one of the things that he said was we have to remove the idea of the myth of absence uh, so the, the, you know, people say that people say, well, we don't know where there are any people of color who do X, Y, and Z thing. Um, I don't know of any black composers. I don't know of any women composers. Right. And so people there, you know, there's this myth of absence and, and the way that he framed that, which I thought was really helpful was he said, you know, let's think about through the history of mankind. Think about if you're in a museum and the history of mankind and you're in a museum that's got all of the greatest works of art um, in the history of mankind. Then you walk into that same museum and you remove all of the artworks that are by women. And then you remove all the artworks that were made by people of color. And then you say, what is left is how we're going to define quality, how we're going to define history, how we're going to define, how we're going to determine um, you, our theory, the basis of all of our history. And so what, what would it look like if we were dealing with now, where you have a whole group of people who just say, all we want to do is put the other pictures back up. That's it. We just want to put the other pictures back up. Uh, so what does that look like? What does the field look like? What does IDRS look like? Uh, what does your institution look like if you committed to just saying, you know what, just going to put all the pictures back up? I think that that was a really good frame. Toyin, do you have a comment? I have so much to say to all that. It's all great. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I'd like to address what Barely Nugent said in the comments here about um, her seminal in ensemble, the Aspen Wind Quintet, which um, I remember listening to while I was at Oberlin, your recording of uh, the Barber Summer music and falling in love with Wind Quintet because of, you know, your, your group. So, you know, you mean a lot to me and we've had a wonderful, uh, I, I, I've learned a lot from you. So you saying in this, in your comment here that you heard our stuff and felt like what we were bringing to you didn't feel like it was appropriate for you to play it's kind of interesting it's kind of interesting because um i feel like now later of course hindsight's 2020 but now a lot of the music that imani wins has commissioned or um jeff or valerie have written are now part of the standard quintet repertoire like we go around the country and we hear quintets playing those all the time for us so i think um it takes people, I don't want to sound like I'm 
giving us too many props, but it takes people going out there and being accepted. And then all of a sudden the world cracks open um, and, and there's more places in, in the gallery for the people of color's beautiful artwork. That's number one. Number two, in the, uh, you know, I was talking about playing and how this time has been a moment. So I've been also uh, digging down the rabbit hole of what a more inclusive conservatory would look like, you know? And I've been thinking more and more about what music history and music theory would look like if it was being more inclusive. Uh, everybody, if you haven't read it yet, there's an incredible article by uh, the theorist, music theorist, Philip Yule, um, who wrote about the racism of Shanker. And Sh um, he was a horrible, horribly racist uh, German guy. And yet he's considered the epitome of um, his, his, sty his, um, his, his uh, style of analysis is considered the epitome of analysis. And we never talk about what he said and what he's done. And Philip Ewell also goes on to talk about how, well, if you were being having an inclusive music theory class, would that mean that the people who've been teaching it the old way would get a third of the time and then would, or half of the time, and then half of the rest of it is done by people of color and, 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 um, and uh, taught about people of color's music theory. And it's just like a, it's a, a huge, uh, monstrous beautiful thing that is just opening up because we're all having a moment to think about this and what would music history look like of course too and one last thing i wanted to talk about and all of that is just a thought like we've got to open our brains in new ways for for how we're teaching not just uh composers but how we teach the basic theory of what we do but also i wanted to talk about inclusivity and what inclusivity means which is being able to sit down at the table and feel welcome. And so a lot of times um, I was talking to one of the institutions I'm involved with and they were saying, well, how could we make black people feel more comfortable at this institution? And the first three things I said had nothing to do with being black. I talked about how we should be more open to people doing independent studies if they can't work their ways into what they can tr can traditionally think um, the the curriculum should be or uh, being uh, taking different types of credits from different types of institutions i feel like people hear inclusivity and think it doesn't apply to them if they're not a person of color but it is absolutely i think our institutions should do a better job of making us all feel welcome and all of our different beautiful aspects of ourselves be we um um, of the LGBT community, be we uh, people of uh, differently abled people, all of these people need to feel like they have a place at the table and then all of us will feel more welcome there. It's, it's a thing that applies not just to us, but to everyone. No, thank you. Thank you for, for your comments about inclusivity. Number the, well, first off, uh, the, a quote that I've always remembered is you can't, uh, you can't find a solution to a problem using the same thinking that created the problem. Uh, and so what people are trying to say is from where we are in the thinking right now, how do we get to the solution? And the truth is you can't get there, <laughs> right? Because where we are right now, it was that thinking is what, that's what created the problem in the first place. Uh, so it's gonna require a completely different type of thinking. Uh, that's what's needed. And I would say, you know, as we think about this idea of inclusivity, um, and thank you, Toyin, for, for bringing that up. Uh, it, it, to be honest, you know, in my opinion, and this is where I've gotten, inclusivity doesn't mean inviting me to your table. It doesn't mean serving me your food and comfort. That's not what inclusivity means to me. Inclusivity means saying, hey, we're thinking about getting a table. Let's go and get a table together. Hey, we're thinking about making a menu. Let's make a menu together. Right? It's not we've already gotten the table we've already prepared the menu but do you maybe you can help us pick one of the bottles of wine i don't feel included in that no offense that is not what inclusion is um that is that is um that at that point you are centering around the host it's all centered around the host 
And so one of the comments that we shared in, uh, in the affinity space uh, is the comment that I made, so I feel comfortable making it here, uh, was the idea of decentering the social construct of whiteness from the decision making. Just decenter that. You know, that would be a good start. Um, because it's not saying remove it. I think to, uh, to Monica's point about not playing Beethoven or playing Brahms, it's not removing it. It's just maybe what does it look like if we decenter it? What does it look like if we put other things in the center? Of which that thing might be just a small part. So what does that look like from an equity perspective? So the next thing I want to talk about um, is, and we've talked a little bit about it, but we haven't gotten deeper into it. Uh, several of you have mentioned this idea. Uh, you have called, you know, the, the way that, anyway, I'm just going to say it, tokenism. Um, you, several of you alluded to the idea of tokenism, right? Uh, whether it's in uh, a chamber ensemble that's like, okay, we decided we wanted to have a, you know, play a black composer. Why don't we have a whole concert of black composers? And then the rest of our series is all white composers, right? <laughs> you know, we should have more black musicians. Hey, why don't we have a concert where we just invite some black people <laughs> to come and play on this one concert and then they're gonna play black music. And then the rest of our series will be a traditional concert series. So each one of us has had some experience with tokenism. Um, can you, do you mind sharing if you're comfortable uh, what are either A, your experiences there, or B, what does that look like? Um, and this is a moment in which I will unfortunately center whiteness uh, because tokenism is something that we know about. Uh, <laughs> we recognize it when we see it. Um, so for this one question, this is actually directed toward that construct of whiteness as it relates to tokenism. Uh, so would, does anyone feel comfortable sharing your experience with that, your thoughts on that, maybe even sharing what it looks like um, and how that has landed on you when you have recognized that you thought you were being invited as an artist, but then you realize you're being invited as a token? Uh, I, know we've, I know I've experienced that. I imagine others of us might have too. I'm happy to jump in. Please. So um, my experience of tokenism, well, I've grew up in a white middle class neighborhood and I've always been the only black um, person in the orchestra, I think from, a, from about four. So I've kind of been used to it. But it's when I turned about 18 or 19, I look back and realized some things weren't quite right. For instance, uh, if it was me, I, had the, I think I had two other black friends in school and I noticed how I might be on first, that person might be playing the violin, but they're on the back row. But yeah, when you look at the prospectus, we're all on the front of it. It's, uh, tokenism is also looking at a concert program, like what you just said, there's one black composer that's there, but then if you look at the people that are behind it, the people that are in charge of the programming, the producers, the administrators, they're all white. And uh, the reason why people have kind of need to be behind the scenes, as well as being represented on stage, is because by having that, you have this cultural hybrid where you have an effective way of taking somebody who's been for that experience and putting it together and being able to show how to affect what we're going through without that feeling, if that makes any sense. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Gary, did you have a comment as well? Thank you, Essie. Yeah, you know, so when we talk about um, tokenism, I think one of the, the, the big pitfalls there is finding a black person, finding a woman, finding a person of color who's supposed to be the representative. And the fact of the matter is, you know, even within these conversations, we do not represent a monolith. Um, and and I, I, I feel comfortable saying this because I've said this to Lacoli before, you know, we, we all heard the analogy of the, the museum, you know, where we take all of these things down and, we're, and where we're adding things back. You know, I'm of the belief that that museum needs to be burned down, okay? When it comes to, you know, well, I still love Brahms, I still love Beethoven. As far as I'm concerned, that love is only a result of, of our conditioning. You know, I think more of us need to take a step back and decide, am I really moved 
by this pe by Brahms theory? Am I actually moved by Beethoven five? And and maybe maybe you are. I'm not saying that it's wrong not to be, but it's important, you know, on, on the subject of tokenism to really understand that we do not represent a a monolith. Um, you know, my my opinions on on you know being invited somewhere um, because I'm black has really evolved. You know, when I. I, I I'm, I'm not, you know, um, an older person in the field. You know, I, I played the bassoon professionally for about 10 years, but even in that time, I saw myself fighting harder, you know, trying longer and all of that on top of the outside dramas of being black. The day I um, auditioned for the Knoxville Symphony, um, you'd have thought the Old South uh, rose again. It was Memorial Day, but there wasn't an American flag in sight. It was all Confederate flags, okay? So imagine the this, this stresses on me walking into that concert hall trying to focus and, and, and play this music. If someone invites me somewhere um, because I'm Black, if I'm the diversity hire, it's because being Black costs a lot and, and, and I accept it because I deserve it. And I think we all do. I think we need to, um, as black people, you know, and I know we were supposed to be, you know, centering whiteness here. It's hard for me to do that. I think as black people, we need to decide that we are owed. We need to, we need to really think back to, you know, what, what lies behind us every June, you know, so I, I initiated the, um, the very first Juneteenth celebration um, at American Public Media. And I thought it was very important for me to share photos of my ancestors. My great grandmother uh, was born on a plantation, a woman that I knew New. You know, we, we took walks until I was about four or five years old when she died at the age of, 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 uh, of 90 something. Uh, my grandmother, whose birthday is today, she's turned 78 today. You know, she, um, she spent her childhood working on, on, a, um, on, on a, a, a sharecropping, you know. So for, for folks like us to have come from that and have still managed to make it, I don't think there's anything wrong with us accepting anything because we're black, because we're owed it as far as I'm concerned. Wow, that is a really interesting way to decenter whiteness. <laughs> that is an interesting. One day we're gonna have a, we're gonna have several conversations about that one someday. Um, uh, what I want to do. Oh, I'm sorry. I, yeah, everybody's here. Um, I thought we were just me and Gary talking for a minute. I was that, I was listen, I was hearing every word. But I'm just being honest. Um, so I would love to open it up. We'll, we'll go back to a few questions for me, but um, I now know that there are uh, Leah. Are there questions that are coming in through the chat? Uh, I'd love to give just a few minutes uh, here at this point for questions from the from the audience. There are no questions in the chat, but uh, by by all means, feel free to add them or raise your hand and uh, post. If them. anyone has a question, or you can raise your hand as well. Uh, Wendy, I see you raising your hand. Hi, I I wanted to go back to. Um, the idea of inclusivity and just offer another way to frame that. I think the word inclusion in and of itself is exclusionary. I think we need to reframe that and start using the word belong. Our uh, African American cultural music belongs in performance, in theory. We've given the world so much. I love to say, and I say all the time, we are the culture. And I know my African American friends have heard this phrase. We are the culture. We make the culture. We belong there. Women belong uh, to be represented. Um, everybody belongs there. And saying we're included are saying, we're over here doing this great thing, just what Lacolian was saying. But I guess you can come over here for a few minutes. You know, we don't, you know, we have a little bit of time. Yes, you can come on over. So I think we need to reframe that. We belong there in the first place. We have always belonged there. Um, so that's the first thing. Actually, I'm going to stop there. I have a lot to say, but I want to let other people have a, a turn. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Leah, are there any questions in the chat? Thank you for sharing that with me. Yes, there's a question from John Steinmetz. Many of our music institutions are resistant to change. Would you share some examples of change that you have seen? A great one is the way that Imani Wayne's repertoire has found its way into so many other groups and schools' repertoires. Uh, uh, I'll, speak to that a, I'll speak to that a bit. Um, and um, I think the best way to, to share that, to share some examples are things that have happened for us, with us, Imani Wins, and institutions that have brought us for more than just your 
Black History concert, right? Um, speaking of tokenism, um, and I and I do have some thoughts on that very briefly that that I'll go back to in a, in a quick moment. Um, yeah, we've seen examples that of of I mean I've I've have no problem sharing to, to calling out some great examples. The University of Chicago, for instance, you know the one of the ivory tower institutions, um, but that that had a really really progressive. Um, uh, executive director in um, Amy Iwano who chose to have us who picked us for for a two year residency. Um, and uh, this was in 2016 to 2018. And that two year residency, she she was she was a part of several um, commissions, one that celebrated um, Gwendolyn Brooks, one that brought uh, some pieces that we actually subsequently recorded um, that were part of something that we call um, well, the civil rights, the, the revolutionary project, really, and that uh, she she sponsored a commission that was um, Henry Threadgill. Um, so, well, she was a part of that of that commissioning team. So that was you know an incredible opportunity, and it took just a really forward thinking um, executive director or artistic director or leader of a particular organization to to just sh put your money where your mouth is, frankly. Um, Duke University also has has been really supportive of us, um, and I don't think this is this is like you know even remotely a tokenism type of thing or or just a you know here's here's a couple of breadcrumbs thrown your way. Um, they they at least from our perspective, I'm sure you know folks that might have went to University of Chicago or Duke may have their own opinions, and obviously those are those are valid. Um, but we saw that that there are organizations out there that are not reactionary and do have some sense of um, a, a desire to have as a part of their infrastructure real devotion to to some to some change and to some diversity. Um, totally also agree with this belonging idea that, that Wendy shared and that's even becoming one of the letters, if you will, as a part of the DEI. DEIB is 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 and it's being expanded, um, I think, and with the word belonging being a part of it, recognizing the, uh, the, the inherent flaws that do exist with just diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and uh, I, I, you know what, I, I, I got a couple of things. I'll, I'll go back to really, really fast what Barely um, mentioned in her, in her, um, in her comments um, about the composers that we had at the beginning of our career that were black and brown composers, Jeff's music, Valerie's music, um, and that being sort of ours. And you know what? I have to say that, of, of course, now as Tony said, it is become part of the, the standard repertoire for wind quintets. Um, I honestly have to say I appreciate the, I, the, the, the point that you're putting out there, Barely, that it was um, music that we kind of needed to hold on to. I think so much is kind of stripped away from us as, as black musicians early on or not early on, just throughout um, that identity becomes just kind of taken away because you are so in so many uh, instances forced to be a part of the status quo. You know, you're, you're just because you love the instrument, because you love this, 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 this music, you kind of have to be put into these positions. So when we do have the chance to have music that is ours, even if it is for a brief amount of time, to have the wherewithal to say, that's not for us right now, you know, Aspen Wynn Quintet. I, I appreciate that, I have to say. You know, I, I think that that's a, really, that's a really thoughtful way to think because we just don't have those chances um, in so many other instances. In, in a moment, uh, uh, but before we get to Barely's comment and then Janine's, um, and one of the things that I would share with that, and now I'm going to remove myself from, from centering around whiteness, is what does it look like, you know, if, if we think about, if, if, we, if we accept that as an idea, then we have to think about the trauma of a Black quintet potentially playing music that's not written by Black people. Right. If we if we're willing to accept the idea that, hey, there's there is something that matters about the art and who's doing it. Right. Right. Then we have to acknowledge the fact that maybe when you have, you know, uh, female students, uh, when you have, you know, students of color, that maybe making them play music by white men is having an impact on them. See, that's that next step. If we acknowledge, because if we acknowledge it one way, you know, if we acknowledge it from a white perspective, we've got to acknowledge it from a black perspective. 
too. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Uh, that's that's that next step that, that is often just not, I'm so sorry, I interrupted. No, no, please go ahead, you do you. No, no, yeah, and that's that. That's just the next step that is often not examined. And and you just said it, you said it, Lacolian, that, that, oh, okay, yeah, I get that. But now, wow, let me actually, for a, for a, a fleeting moment, put myself in your shoes and, and, and think about, you know, how it is where you, what it feels like to have to create your entire own repertoire, you know? So yeah, very, that, that's, that's that next level. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and if I could just very, very, very quickly interject, I think when it comes to resistance to change, we have to consider the alternative. Okay. I live in a, in a city, I live in an area where um, the police's resistance to change resulted in the third precinct being burned down, okay? Uh, police brutality is the biggest example of, of, of how the oppressor is maintaining power. So when we go down that list, you know, we're eventually going to get to the concert hall. We're going to get to your conservatories. We're going to get to your other institutions. And if you are, and, and if you remain resistant to change, that's all that, that's all that lies ahead of you is a, is a, a pile of ashes. And I, and I don't even, I don't even exaggerate. Like that is really where we're headed as a country. The revolution is happening and uh, resistance to change is just not an option. Thank you for that. Uh, Barely and then, and then uh, Janine. Well, Monica and Twain, I just wanted to say I'm so grateful for your kind words. I really appreciate them. And, and Monica, you said something about when you started the Imanis, um, you weren't quite sure you know, what if it would grow into something, you were just doing a few things. But I remember so clearly when you guys started. I remember almost the moment I heard about you guys and saw your first publicity picture. And I knew that what you were doing, I mean, it hit me like a ton of bricks because I realized that here's all this music. I mean, you guys were doing the Hendemith and all this other stuff that we were sharing together, <laughs> your group and mine. Um, but you were also bringing forth all this music that it had never occurred to us to look for. And I think, I mean, it was apparent immediately. So if there's any question in your mind, looking back to ancient history, you know, of 20 or so years ago, um, what you did and the importance of what you were doing was immediately apparent from the first minute. And we all knew that. So if you weren't sure about that, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Really Thank you. Good. And it's Thank so you. fabulous. That's why we decided to just, uh, that's why we decided to leave the, we all wanted to be orchestral musicians or composers or something else, but that's why we stood, stayed with it because we realized we had something special happening. But thank you for, um, thank you for that, Barely. Likewise. Thank you. Janine? Unmute. You're, you're, you're muted, Janine, sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? I'm gonna catch up a little bit, but going back to what Monica was talking about and also Lucolian. Uh, so I'm white and um, I think that there, I see a lot of white faces at the, this meeting today. And I'm guessing that many of you are thinking the same thing that I am and that, what can I do? So many of you, and I'm speaking to the white people, have sat in the orchestra and seen these things take place with your um, colleagues who look or sound different than um, you do. And the question, what can I do, um, feels like I'm putting, if I ask my Black colleagues, what can I do, it feels like I'm putting the burden on them to come up with the answer. If I take an initiative and do something, then I have a fear of the tokenism that you're talking about. So I'm really, really grateful that we're having this particular conversation because Lakoli and I think you've actually nailed it the, um, in your explanation of it's inviting the discussion to be a, a collective thing, the belonging and saying, okay, let's go eat. Where are we going to go and decide together? Let's play something together. Let's play something together. Let's decide together. I am gonna. We play the. I play the oboe, and there are not so many oboists in the world. There are probably even fewer bassoonists, and um, it's hard to find enough oboists as it is. It's hard to find enough oboists of color, also. So that I don't know what the answer is, except to pick up on what Alvin, especially what Lacolian was saying, to just keep the conversation going because I don't know what else to do without putting the burden somewhere else or 
causing a sense of tokenism. <laughs> Sure. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, for that vulnerability. And thank you for bringing that to the space. Uh, Toya, it looks to me like you had, you wanted to respond to that one. Yeah. Um, Janine, thank you for asking these questions and being ready to have something new happen. And if anybody else is in the same boat, I would say the same thing that I've been um, saying to my friends, uh, acquaintances and strangers who've been uh, coming to me with the same question which is if you want to know what you can do, um, I think it's not, uh, like you're saying, you don't have to look to anybody else to find the answers. It's a very simple uh, 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 recipe. Money, time, humbleness, and activity. Thank money, you. time, humbleness, and activity. You, you can put your money where your mouth is and take on students who uh, might not be able to afford it. If you're looking specifically to help black and brown kids, then there are lots of kids who are interested in playing double reed instruments. Um, I lived in Chicago when, uh, for a while, playing in the Chicago Civic Orchestra. And um, I went and played at a community music school that was mostly black and brown kids. That's, by the way, due to gentrification, I've heard it's not the case anymore. But um, I went there and I had five st beginning oboe students of color there. And I don't think it was just because um, I went there and I was black. I think it was because I went there with my heart open and gave a killer uh, presentation about the oboe. And people were excited about the instrument and they started doing it. So um, by, I want to touch briefly on gratitude um, in my uh, formula there. Um, I think a lot of people, when they get excited about stuff, they go with the sense of, I want to save everybody and I want to make things better for you. But I think this applies to being a teacher in general. I think a lot of the way that the, the whole teaching, the sacred trust of uh, I think Garrett was touching on this, a private teacher with private student is that we are this being upon high that is going to bestow this knowledge upon you. And I feel like when we come into communities and talk to people, we cannot go with that attitude. We're going there to save our jobs because as we know, audiences are shrinking. As we know, audiences are aging. As we know, Audiences are mostly, for our, the music that we play, are mostly non-people uh, of color. So this is not just for them. Plus, on a personal level, I learn, you learn so much from your students. If you are more open, this is what inclusivity or belonging is about. There, if you feel like, I feel like there's, there's always this danger of being thrown out of an institution, right? And that's, you know, what it is. But we belong there. We all belong there. So money, time, humbleness, activity. And don't just sit there and think about things. Start doing things. Think, imagine what you want to do and do it. It might not work out, just like everything else. When you try something new with a Latambo, it might not happen. You might not get that low B, but you got to try it anyway. Thank you, Toyin. Actually, I want to I wanna jump in on that one, too. Um... There's a, I think it's an important thing to note, especially if you're thinking about being an anti-racist space, is that racism hurts white people also. Like, like racism is bad for white people too. Um, so whereas, you, you know, if you want, even if you wanted to go to it, well, you're not helping me, if you even took a narcissistic frame to it, right? What are the ways in which racism hurts white people? The truth is, there are some brilliant people around. I think I'm super dope. I've, I have walked in, I have finally learned to walk in that, right? That I actually know what I'm doing, right? And, you know, that, that racism would keep some places from me, right? The, you know, I could be the person who has the answers for that place and their own framing, well, they won't see me, right? And so like, I think it's important and that's a, that's a, that's a point for many of, of us, right? is that, and I think it's, to, it's, it's important to note that racism actually hurts white people too. Um, I, and, 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 and what can white people do? I would say that many of the people in this room, especially white people in this room, because I know a lot of your faces, all of, many of you are in positions of authority somewhere. You have decision-making power 
in many places. You have decision-making power on the scholarships that you give out. You have decision-making power on the repertoire that your students have. Some of you are deans. You have, you, some of you sit on curriculum committees at your universities, right? Like, don't get it twisted. I've been in all of that. And so I know the power that we wield in, our, in, our, in higher education, right? And, and so the question for us is, how do we use that power? Because to be honest, to be honest, if we're not using that power to change that system, then that thing that's burned, that building that Garrett's talking about being dirt, burned down is going to be one with us in it, right? Because if we're not opposed, if we're not fighting that system, then we are part of it, right? That, and that's it. it. There is, unfortunately, that's one of those things that you don't get to be neutral, right? Either you are, either you are liberating or you are oppressing. <laughs> right? And that is it. And I think it's so important for people to walk in that and to sit in that for a minute. So we think about what you can do. The first thing you can do is, if you have students, look at the repertoire that they play. Look at what your expectations are of them. Right? If you're in a position of authority in university, look at the people around, look at the rooms that make decisions. And then say, this room is deficient, which means the decision coming from it is going to be deficient. Right, like that is the thing that that's the reframe that is necessary. Is that you know it's not to be honest. I don't need somebody to help me. Right, the truth is I'm smart. I finally realize that now. Just don't hinder me. That's all. <laughs> right, like that's all I need is don't hinder me. You know you don't have to tokenize me. You don't have to give me it. Just don't hinder my growth. Right? And the truth is, what racism does is it hinders, right? That's a thing that it does. And each one of us in our institutions, myself included, with all humility, myself included, hindered people, right? Only the ones who were able to fight through were able to make it. But that should not have been a requirement. That should have, should have required this field and this work that we do shouldn't require cultural suicide in order for people to have access to it. I should be able to keep my identity and play the bassoon. I shouldn't have to pick. And there are people around and people who are nodding their heads right now, and you're the ones I'm talking to, to be, to be honest. People who are, who are nodding their heads right now are people who feel that. That I've got to pick between being who I am or this thing that I love because I can't have both. I have one more question uh, before I open it up fully to questions from the group. Um, I have one more question uh, and it is about um, that idea of cultural suicide. Some of you might, I know I experienced that um, and some of you may not have experienced it, um, but I'd be curious to know uh, when you were, was there a music and a life that you lived before you got into classical music? And then this, this life that you lived when you were in, and then you had to like try to find some balance between the life that you really, the person that you had been the majority of your life, and then the person that you were inside classical music. You know, so being, so like listening to, for me, it was like listening to Biggie, but also listening to Brahms. Right, <laughs> like, like, uh, was, did anyone have an experience that was something similar to that? I want to very, very, very quickly address that phrase classical music. So when people ask me, when was I exposed to classical music? I tell them from birth because I grew up in a house where uh, my mom and my grandma sang spirituals. I grew up in the black church where the spiritual is very much a part of that. If there is any music in America that is most classic to being America, in my opinion, it's the Negro spiritual. So. I, so I don't have a life before classical music. My life before Western classical music, that's a different conversation, but I, I wanna leave the floor open, but I just wanted to make sure that that point was known. Thank you, thank you for that. Well, you might as well answer the question now, bro, if you gonna jump in and do that, well, you might as well just, you might as well speak, you already spoke the truth, go on ahead. Um, okay, so, so, so concerning uh, cultural uh, suicide, is something that I, I began to understand again when it came to my, um, enlightening, the idea that these two worlds had to be separate, the idea that, you know, I, I had to dress a certain way or talk a certain way or believe a certain thing to be in the concert hall versus, you know, when I'm hanging out with the homies. So, you know, part of my 
uh, again, a, a part of my awakening uh, was just really uh, understanding that I was separating two things that uh, shouldn't be separated or, or, or don't um, have to be uh, separated. Um, and, and just five seconds to go back to the question of what can I do? I'm going to shout out Alex. You know, one of the conversations we had was about um, being oppressed and being oppressor simultaneously. I think one of the um, one of the best things that a person can do is understand by what means are you that oppressor, and by what means can you stop that oppression? And you know, if that's not immediately um, uh, possible, find ways in which to you know, as Lacolian and others said, use that power to um, to to empower women and to empower people of color. Thank you, Garrett. Any other comments on this idea of cultural suicide and how it might have manifested itself? Um, I guess I'll take it briefly. Um, I was always brought up around classical music. Uh, my parents were uh, lovers and listeners of classical music. Um, I was part of programs that in DC where the actually people of color were the majority so um, I was always lucky to have that kind of feeling. So I never felt it um, really. If anything, I felt the opposite of it, which was um, I felt like I wasn't black enough at time. Uh, it's not that I was uh, doing cultural su suicide. My natural nature of how I spoke and what I liked was uh, not was not what uh it's it's different from suicide because it was I, I never made a choice it was it was all always there so um that's a thing that we haven't talked even touched on which is colorism too uh like we're mostly like light-skinned people here um and i know some of my dark-skinned friends who have um liked music uh, or liked classical music or been involved with it uh they have felt like they have never been um, accepted in in either in either way. Sorry, sorry, I'm getting a phone call here. I'll I'll just go off with that. But you know, there's there's all sorts of layers of experience of blackness and belonging. So I'll just leave with that. Child, you know we don't talk about colorism in front of company. Uh, <laughs> <Well. laughs> That's not what I'm <laughs> We, don't we, only got, we only got so much time, right? <laughs> yeah, we only got, yeah, we got company here. You know, we can't talk about that in front of others. Uh, no, I, but I, I, I'm just joking. I, I do, I, I totally hear that. Um, in our last 10 minutes, I would love to open it up for uh, just the last couple of comments and questions from, from the room. Does anyone have anything they would like to either A, ask of the panelists? Uh, if you are an introvert, I wanna make sure that you feel some comfort in this time. If you're an introvert, Leah Uribe, uh, she is uh, taking questions. Uh, so if you wanted to send something directly to Leah so that it doesn't show up in the chat, if you are, again, for the introverts out there, if that feels uncomfortable for you, um, I would also like you to know there's another avenue for you to only communicate with one person directly. Uh, and that would be Leah. And you can find her under participants. And if you click on her name, a message will go directly to her. Uh, so I want to make sure that the introverts uh, have some space in this room as well. Uh, but if you have your hand raised, I can't see everyone. Uh, but if you, uh, someone wanted to ask a question of the room, I know there's a lot to think about, especially if your entry point into black oppression is, um, is, not, is not so strong, um, then this was a lot. Uh, and so I, I definitely hear that. Um, but I see that we have one. There's a question from Aliyah uh, Nelson on the chat that uh, that Leah could maybe wear or read? Yes, Sorry. I have it. Alaya, uh, Alia Nelson, um, as a black female oboist in London, I have found that most people find it strange that I play the oboe. My question is, when people find it strange that I play that instrument, is it because they are resistant to change or is it the fear of change in coming? To get to the oboe, I had to go through a number of instruments as that was never shown to me until my teacher saw that I found all the other woodwind instruments quite simple to play. Would either of the Black Oboists like to respond to that Black Oboe question? I've talked a lot. I want to hear more from Esther. Esther? So I'm just rereading the question again. 
Let me find it. It's basically when people find it strange that I play that instrument, is it because they are resistant to change or is it the fear of change in coming when they find out? I that think I about both. I think voice. about both. Um, I've noticed when I'm, uh, when oboists uh, have their first lesson, they have always been told um, that they either there's something about their features that don't fit the instrument, such as their lips and um, such as their jawline, their structure of themselves. And it's, um, I think it's just the perception and how they see us. And that's what needs to change in teaching. And um, one of the things I think about is, you know, when you're remaking, you change the shape of the K and that alters the sound. You change the staple, it alters the sound. I, rather than seeing our features, ourselves as something that's different, I like to think it's another dimension to the sound. The fact that you have bigger lips just means that you've got another way of softening the sound, the way of manipulating the sound that others can't do. And it's a, it, you can see it as a resistance to change because they don't know what it is. They don't know how to deal with it. They don't know what to do. So I think it's just a matter of pursuing what you're doing, keep doing what you're doing, and then just know that you'll be fine. Um, I'll add a little bit too, I guess, because uh, I can't help it. I like to talk. Uh, we live in a postmodernist world where people like to have labels and talk about who who everybody is. It gives them comfort. So people like to put other people in boxes, black oboist, um, lesbian trombonist. You know, we, there's all sorts of labels that are put on us. And I think now maybe I'm, I'm maybe I'll get a little too philosophical right now, but we're living uh, not through most of our political times, but we're living in a time when these boxes are being broken down and not necessarily in ways that we like, actually, um, but they are being broken down. And I think things will change from this. I think things will change. Uh, but I think, I mean, there's all sorts of types of oppression, Aaliyah, like there's all sorts of different types of discrimination. So I don't think it'll ever end. Um, but I think we can um, start this whole, you know, how sexuality, people don't want to be called by one pronoun or another. Um, so I feel like uh, we are in a place now where we can speak freely on the thing of, I don't want to be called a black oboist if I don't want to. I can choose to be called whatever I want. Um, or I do want to be called a black oboist. I kind of like that. I'm, I'm, I've made my career out of that, so it's been ha helpful to me. But uh, I think, uh, again, what everybody has been saying here, too, is step off the ledge of what people, other people think of you and be who you want to be and frame it from your own perspective as opposed to what they are thinking about. You're probably doing that already, but um, just uh, giving you the power to go on with it. My one quick commentary um, is also to this question or this this point. Uh, people find it real strange. They don't know me. Uh, very strange that I play the bassoon. They 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 literally think I'm an alien that has walked from an off off of some spaceship somewhere. <laughs> so this black dreadlock woman playing the bassoon is is just you can't comprehend it. It's too much information. So uh, I I feel your pain. I just wanted to say you're not alone in this concept and your question, your direct question of is it because they are resistant to change or they, they fear the change coming, guess what? That's not your responsibility to even wonder. It, it, you, you can ask it because we're humans, we're nature, we, we are curious by nature, but at the end of the day, that is somebody else's hang up, somebody else's problems that, that you yourself need not burden yourself with. You just do you, keep going, being excellent, doing, you know, doing whatever it is that you need to do to, to fulfill yourself and to continue the, the, the path that you want to be on and continue that journey. And obviously, we, things are going to affect us, but it really is, is not even, um, it's not even something that has to concern you when it comes down to it. I would encourage you to think that way. Preach. Uh, Monica, I just want to first off, thank you so much for just saying the words, you are not alone. Um, and I would say that um, many of the uh, individuals of color, whether they're the only person of color on their faculty, or they're the only person of color in their studio, or the only person of color in their entire university, right? Um, you know, th th it, there is, and I think that with the, you just saying that to some another human here, 
I think is so beautiful because um, it's important to note that that is the feeling that is felt is that you're actually alone. Um, and, and so I really want to just uh, thank you for, for bringing that into the space and also sharing that with someone in the space, uh, because I would say that too, um, you are absolutely not alone um, as far as the things you're experiencing right now. And I, you know, I say for my own self, that's something I wish I had known as a high school kid and beyond that I wasn't alone. I remember I saw Monica the first time and I was like, and I, it was after I finished, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> right? Someone who does this and like really, really takes it seriously. Like they're devoting their life to this thing. Like it was so powerful for me and made things a lot easier just overall in my own development was meeting you at the end of my undergrad. And so there you are again, they, letting someone know that they're not alone. So the reason that landed on me is because it was meaningful to me that that was an impact that you had on my own life. Uh, so I just, you know, I, and thank you for that. And I'm glad that you're still doing it. Uh, there's one other question from Piera, uh, and this will be, unfortunately, our yes, that's yet. Yeah, you'll be our last question for the day. And, um, and so please, uh, please, uh, you can unmute yourself. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Piera, and I'm a novel player from Chile. So I started, I just wanted to share something really quick. Like, I started in New York, and before that, my former teacher was American too, white. And in the principal orchestra of Chile, there is mainly just white people from Europe or United States. There is not, there was like two people from my country at that time when I was there. So as I, start, I started studying with her, uh, people start seeing me more like, oh, she's good. She, she can make it. But I realized with the time that it wasn't for me. I'm sorry, that's my dog. Sorry. Uh, it wasn't because of me. It was because of her. Because I was kind of representing her in a, in a way. So that respect, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. She always does that when I'm talking. Um, so it wasn't because of me, it was because of her, because in a certain way, it was representing her. So she did all this process of me taking, of her taking me to America to put me in that great school and supporting me. But once I got there, I didn't have like a known voice. I was her voice. And then that started to change when I started meeting more people like of my same instrument in the same field and colored people and Asian people and we kind of we were all in the same like uh, platform of I don't know who are you you're you don't know who, I'm, who, who I am but we play the same thing we're sharing the same feeling so it doesn't matter what color you are or what language you speak we speak the same language through the music and we are the guardians of peace through the music because everyone can understand it so it wasn't until I met Imani Wins that I went to a festival with them that I can actually find my own voice playing my own music. And it, that's okay. I love Beethoven. I love Mozart. I love everything. But if something I learned being in America, North America, I'm sorry, <laughs> is that I, you shouldn't be afraid of making art. You shouldn't be afraid of... of raising your voice or turning down bad comments like people will often tell me you don't look like a novel player and i'll be like oh really what should we look like <laughs> should i be i don't know green eyes or super white or that's okay and if i'm using the privilege well i'm using the privilege that my teacher gave me to bring it back here to my country and encourage kids of like way younger than me that they have to just dare to do something not because of someone else told you to not you should stop because otherwise i mean they are not breathing for me they don't fit me they don't work for me i'm doing all but by myself and for myself and to make my family proud that i can actually be someone out of the out of the plate <laughs> out of that like oh the doctor thing the engineering thing the so I just want to thank you, all of you, and for giving me the opportunity to, to be someone and to feel that I'm someone and that, I, and that my instrument is just not an instrument, it's an extension of my, of my body and my mind. So 
that's Thank all you. that I want us to say. Thank you. Thank you. And we're oh, we're totally out of time. Shameless plug. Check out Imani Wins Chamber Music Festival. We have a three day virtual <laughs> event on August tenth through the twelfth. Uh, okay. Imaniwinsfestival.com. You you can see information. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I'm just going to thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Thank you to our panelists. Maybe a virtual round of applause for our panelists. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you all. Thanks, everyone. I just want to make uh, tell one short thing before before we sign off, uh, and it's a story that I have shared. Uh, uh, really, more of a, a tale that I share oftentimes uh, at the end of, of workshops like this one. Um, uh, so just a little story. Just imagine, if you will, um, you're, you're in the jungle and, you know, in the jungle, there's this giraffe and the giraffe has the most beautiful home. Everyone has recognized the giraffe as having the most beautiful home in the jungle. Uh, and so everyone's really excited about going to the giraffe's ha home and many animals in the jungle have been there. One day the giraffe um, comes across the, an elephant. The elephant says, hey, I've heard about your home. I'm actually interested in going. And the giraffe says, absolutely, come over to my home tomorrow. So the elephant goes to the giraffe's home, knocks on the front door, and he looks and said, did I get it backwards? Did I switch it? I don't think I flipped it. Uh, <laughs> the elephant goes to the giraffe's home and uh, realizes he can't get in the front door. And so the giraffe is a really nice giraffe. And the giraffe says, well, hey, it's, it's OK. I, I have a, we can go around the back. That, that door is of the right size. I know you can get into that door. So the elephant's like, OK, well, I'll go through the back door. The giraffe comes through. The elephant walks in and bumps into something uh, and knocks it over. And the, the giraffe is super gracious, like, you know, it's OK. These are, these are my things. But it's, it's OK. It's not a big deal. These things happen. Um, and then the giraffe says, oh, but the most beautiful part is in the back. You've got to come back here and see it. And the elephant goes and realizes they can't get down the hallway. Um, and, and then the elephant then bumps into something else. And then the giraffe says, you know, I'm really so sorry. This just isn't working. Uh, and the elephant says, well, it's because this place wasn't built for me. This place wasn't built with me in mind. Maybe what we can do is go outside and build a new house together that's built for both of us. And so the things that we're talking about in moments like this, you know, just to, to a point that was made earlier, it's not about making a giraffe's house fit an elephant. It's about building a new house that's specifically made for all of us to be in it. And so that is the thing that we're talking about. And that is the thing that we are striving for and, and moving toward. Because the truth is, grassroots movements happen when the system fails. That's when you get a grassroots movement. And grassroots movements are happening all over the place right now. And many of us are the system. And so we have to acknowledge the fact that that system has failed and create spaces for people not to have to experience some of the things that we have all talked about as it relates to our experiences. So again, in closing, thank you all so much. I apologize for running over. Uh, but this is a really important conversation, first one at IDRS. Um, and so I really want to, again, thank you all. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, and I am going to log off and leave because that is, an input, that is a quality facilitator. It's when it's time to go, they leave first. So I, again, do just want to thank you all so much and you know, stay plugged into IDRS because uh, there, our IDRS is trying to do better. Uh, and so it needs people like you to continue to not only be part of it, but also hold it accountable when it doesn't do better. So thank you, everybody. Everyone have a great night and a great weekend.